Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So, you may have noticed over the last little while that I've gotten away from the sources that I traditionally use in order to talk about the idea of hero and, in general, the comic book industry. And those would mainly be your Marvel podcasts. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that a lot of these voices have fallen silent. Now, there could be a number of reasons why these voices have fallen silent, some of them good, some of them not so good. It may be that a lot of the people who run these podcasts have simply been laid off, or the resources for what they used to do has just dried up. Now, I don't believe that's the case at all. It could be, but I don't believe that's the case, because certainly in the past with these podcasts, all they are is people talking. They don't need to go into their studio, which they have at Marvel, to record. They can do so from their living rooms, which they have done in the past. And considering the fact that certainly the main podcast for Marvel that I usually talk about is run by Sana Aminat, who is the second in command at Marvel Comics, I really don't think she's been laid off at all. So some of them are still being put out sporadically. Some of them are just having reruns being put up. And the thing is that they do have a time where they are just going to run reruns for these podcasts anyways. But now would not be the time because now is the ramping up for the Comic-Con season, even though they're all digital and online now. This would be their hyperactivity time. And we are certainly not seeing that. We are seeing a shutting down rather than a ramping up. So in my estimation, the reason why a lot of these voices have fallen silent over the last little while is because they simply don't want to get canceled. Again, it was like that video I did about the Punisher a couple of weeks ago. Marvel fell silent on its Twitter page for weeks on end. Marvel typically puts out 5 to 50 tweets a day. Falling silent for nearly two weeks was an indication, certainly to me, that they were shutting up so that they wouldn't draw attention to themselves. And so I would assert again that a lot of these podcasts for Marvel and a lot of these people who are in the comic industry who usually are out there talking their heads off about progressivism have fallen silent because they don't want to bring any attention to themselves because they don't want to be canceled. Again, that's just my estimation of the situation, though. And the reason I wanted to go over all of that is because what I want to talk about today is really the general, I don't know, milieu or the background information, the background mindset of a lot of the people within these podcasts and the podcasts themselves. Because usually when I talk about them, I talk about the specific things that they are covering, but there is a background language which a lot of these podcasts have, which is heavy progressivism. Which is really funny because you would think that comic book people would have the overlayered language of comic books, which is dense and hard to understand by people outside of their sphere when they talk. But no, these people have the heavy overlay of progressive language, not comic book language when they speak. And a lot of people, even progressives now, are finding that speaking within the progressive language is like walking through a minefield because you too can be canceled. It reminds me of some of the graffiti you see with these riots going on. Every once in a while, someone puts up somewhere on the side of a building, liberals get the bullet too. And I would say that extends to your progressives as well. If you step at a line, you're going to get it. But what I want to focus on today is how the change and the use of this language that they use all the time within these podcasts is something that is meant to set up a new dynamic of how people think and how people speak and what people believe. And how all of that is directly contrary to the idea of a traditional hero. It needs to indeed kill the idea of a traditional hero. And to do that, once again, I'm going to have to focus on San Aminat. Why? Because she's the most prominent voice calling for all of this, and she is the one who likes to talk the most. But I won't be focusing the entire video on her by any means. So the point is that she was specifically brought into Marvel Comics by Joe Quesada, and she didn't have any real experience within comics except for two years at a failed indie company where we don't even know what she did. By the way, all that I'm about to describe is words from her own mouth, which I covered in a previous video, which actually is two previous videos. I'll link both of those in the description. But she never wanted to have anything to do with comics. She was a political science major, and she wanted to get into journalism, but she couldn't find her way into it. She only did blog posts and things like that until her multi-million dollar brother got her a job within this little comic company who was owned by one of his friends. 
And again, it only lasted for two years and then the company went bust. And she wanted to go back to journalism at that time. She had no intention whatsoever in continuing within the comic industry. But then Joe Quesada showed up at her doorstep and offered her a job working for Marvel Comics because he wanted her to change the entire dynamic of how comics were made. And her reply was she didn't have the experience to do that and he said that's exactly what we want. Now, as I covered in those previous videos, the main reason why Joe Quesada probably showed up at her doorstep and offered her this job was because of all of her political and entertainment ties. Again, because her brother was a multi-millionaire, a producer of many movies which you've probably seen, and her family was heavily progressive, and she has a cousin who she grew up with, who is Huma Abedin, who was the person at that time who was one of the heads of the Clinton Foundation and the head of Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. So it was her ties, her family ties, to the entertainment industry and to the political elites that most likely prompted them to seek her out and bring her into Marvel to change the entire focus of their line. But the smaller question that I want to focus on today, because I've already covered all of that, is how they thought she would be perfect in doing this. Or, at the very least, how she thinks she is perfect in doing this, and how she is doing this in Marvel Comics. Well, I would say that all goes back to her political science background because that was her major in university. And funny enough, that was one of my focuses in university as well, not just in my undergrad either. And I say that because a lot of people don't really get the nuances of what political science is all about. Because political science, people think, well, you're just studying politics, right? And how politics works? Well, yes and no. Yes, you are doing that, but if you look at the foundational documents for political science and why it was set up as a study itself, or at the very least, the main thrust of why it was set up as a separate discipline, it has to deal with something a little more subtle. And as many things within our Western civilization are, it was set up by Aristotle. Aristotle's fundamental book, which set up the study of political science, was the Nicomachean Ethics. And what he talks about in that foundational book is the fact that, first of all, you got to see what the good of mankind is. Individual people and then for a society. And then you want to bring about that good for your society by teaching your people how to act correctly. That is to say, how to act in an ethical and moral way. And when he talks about this, his idea of what ethics and morals should be expressed would be in a virtuous way, which again brings in to it the idea of hero that I'm always talking about because the traditional idea of hero is a paragon of virtue. But of course, if you look again at Sana Amanat and the fact that she has a political science background, well, what did she study? Well, she studied how you are trying to set up the good of a society and then teach your citizens to act in this way through ethics and morals. But the good in her society that she would claim and that people like Joe Quesada would also claim is that the good of the society, as well as the individual if you ever look at them, is progressivism. And indeed, if you look at, again, those older videos that I talked about, Joe Quesada, he wanted to change the focus of comic books and the comic book industry to one that is set upon progressivism. And Sana Amanat understands this and goes straight for it. Because, again, in one of those older videos, the first, I think, that I covered, which would be Sana Amanat talking to Fast Company, and again, I'll link that in the description, she talks about the fact that comics should be pushing positive ideas. And again, positive for her would be progressivism. And she talks about it in terms of the psychological and how you have these super beings as being the new mythology for America. And why does she talk about all that? Well, she talks about it because if you look at the traditional, original way which these ethics and morals were taught to people, it was through mythology. Those points expressed within mythology went through a whole bunch of different disciplines and then eventually got to where we are today and are being promoted through psychology, again, which she talked about. So again, this would lead to the, quote, pushing of positive ideas within these books. Because again, her point as someone who has studied political science, would be to bring about the end good, supposedly, of progressivism within the society by teaching people how to act in an ethical and moral way, supposedly called ethics and morals, of the progressive. But the thing is that these ethics and morals of the progressive destroy at their heart the idea of hero. 
The basic understanding and language itself, not just the movement, but the basic assumptions of the movement, destroy completely the idea of hero. And I want to go over in depth a little bit of that destruction today by a few things that are outside of the comic industry. A few things that have been expressed over the last few weeks by your progressive mainstream and through institutions which are funded by the government. Now, they may be smaller institutions and off to the side, but they are still funded by the government. And these two institutions where I'm bringing this stuff in from, one would be a department of the army, another one would be the Smithsonian. Again, one funded directly, another funded indirectly by the government. But again, these are major institutions within America. And I'm going to talk about it in negative terms because, of course, all of these people are brought up upon this idea of critical theory. Critical theory being that if you want to bring about this good that they want to bring about, which is your progressive society, first you have to destroy the old society. you got to obliterate it. And this is what critical theory is all about. It's about destroying that previous society of Western civilization. It is all about destruction. And the spearhead of this destruction right now is the term racism. So if you want to shut someone up today or destroy their career or destroy what they've worked for or destroy the certain part of Western civilization that they're connected to, you call them a racist. But the funny thing is that when they talk about racism, it's not actually based upon race. And again, you can see this as an underlying assumption by these people who have spoken about this within the comic industry. I just did a video about Tanahishi Coates. He is the writer, the current writer of Captain America, and he talked about racism in terms of whiteness and non-whiteness. Now you notice he specifically says that it's not about the color of your skin, it's about whiteness and non-whiteness, and people of color can have whiteness. However, funny enough, in their little dynamic, people who have white skin cannot extract themselves from whiteness, even though people of color can be, in effect, white through their participation in whiteness. And to give you a more definitive statement about this, I'll give you a quote from, again, the Smithsonian and one of their articles that they recently put online. And it's titled Whiteness, and the little blurb to describe it is as follows. Socially and politically constructed, whiteness is not simply referring to skin color, but is an ideology that reinforces power at the expense of others and strengthens systems of oppression. So, as you see, just like Ta-Nehisi Coates asserted, it's not about the color of your skin, it's about a power dynamic. Whether or not you have whiteness, which is power, or you are non-white, which is the equivalent of not having power. So, two points here. First of all, you see that the entire thing is based upon power. It's not based upon skin color at all. So, if you're called a racist right now, you're being called someone who has a privilege of power and are opposing other people with it. And so, since it has nothing to do with race, it has to do with power, and this power dynamic is the oppressor and the oppressed, this is, of course, just bringing back the idea of the proletariat and the bogracy. This is your socialist, communist, Marxist idea ideology through and through. That's all it is. And that's no surprise to me, certainly, because, again, as two of the three people who instituted BLM and created it to begin with, which is where all of this is coming from right now, they specifically state that their ideological training was in Marxism, and that's the ideological basis of the entire movement. And secondly, I just want to bring in the idea that I'm always talking about. What the focus here is on is on power. And this is why they concentrate on these superheroes. Why? Because super is a declaration of power, and they want to focus on the power part, whereas traditionally we focused on the hero part. And the hero part was in control, and it utilized that power to be heroic. Whereas within these heroes, so-called, that they are using right now, it is the power part, and that defines what the hero is. So again, I want to go over this power dynamic according to a few things that have been employed by high-profile sources that have connections to the government to show how they are destroying the fundamental basis of the idea of hero itself. And again, I do so because this is the language that is in the background of all of these podcasts and statements and interviews that I cover all the time from these comic companies. So the first one, I'll put it up on the screen, although it's really hard to read, it was employed again by, I think it was the Diversity and Inclusion Department of the Army. 
and they're talking about racism. Now, there are a lot of things on this list, and I'm not going to go through them all. I'm just going to go through the ones that touch on the idea of hero. But to give you some idea of the extra things that they put on this list, the following things they consider to be racist. The idea of color blindness is racist. If you say, I don't see color, well, that's racist. Something like Columbus Day, that's racist. If you do not automatically believe the experiences of non-white people, well, that's racist. But the statements that have to deal with the traditional idea of hero that I'm always talking about are as follows. Focusing on European curriculum, well, that's racist. What they call the bootstrap theory, that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, well, if you hold that as something to be true, well, that's racist. Exceptionalism is also declared as being racist, and it doesn't give you any specifications of that exceptionalism. So I take it to be any kind of exceptionalism. If you say that America is an exceptional country and based upon exceptional ideas, those are racist statements. And my focus on hero saying a hero is an exceptional human being, well, that's a racist statement. And also what they declare as the meritocracy myth, that is racist. Now, first of all, in connection with hero, a hero is someone who is merit-based completely and needs to be if they are a traditional hero. So if you get rid of the idea of meritocracy, then you certainly destroy the idea of hero. But this also explains why these people at these comic companies hire the way that they do. Again, if we go back to one of their statements that not believing what people of color have to say is racist, well, you just have to take everything they say at face value. You can't base any of their hiring upon merit because meritocracy is a myth. And if you claim it to be real, you're being racist. Therefore, yes, they are just going to go out and get these people who check off these boxes. That's all that they can do in order to employ people or else they're being racist. And I'll give you a very funny example of this because San Amanat has said that the way that Marvel hires people is that they go out and find you. I actually heard her in one of her podcasts offer a job to a 16 year old girl to write for Marvel. Why? Because she was a female Native American environmentalist. So she checked off those boxes and Marvel didn't have one of those. So she wanted to offer her a job to come write for Marvel before anyone else did. Again, this was a 16 year old girl, but she checked off the right boxes. And that's why she offered her a job on her podcast. A 16 year old girl, by the way, who had nothing to say with any connection to comics whatsoever. So again, meritocracy is racism, therefore it's straight out the window. But let's go to the bigger list, the list from the Smithsonian about what is whiteness. And again, if you're saying something is connected to whiteness, then it is inherently racist. And once again, I'm only going to go over a few brief ones of these. You can look on the screen. This one's a little bit more defined, so you can probably read it from the screen if you want to. So here are a few things that they declare to be a part of whiteness, the oppression system of whiteness, remember. So under the heading of rugged individualism, well, that's whiteness in itself. But under that, there are subheadings. Self-reliance is there, and self-reliance is whiteness and therefore racist. The idea that, and I quote, individuals assumed to be in control of their environment, well, that's whiteness and therefore racist. One of the other headings that is under whiteness is emphasis on the scientific method. So if you emphasize the scientific method, that's whiteness and therefore you're racist. And some of the subcategories under that are objective, rational thinking. So if you want objective, rational thinking, well, that's whiteness and therefore you're racist. Another subheading is cause and effect relationship. That's whiteness and therefore racist. And that's a declaration, by the way, just of logic. That's what logic is based on, cause and effect. Under the heading of history, they have a subcategory of the primacy of Western, Greek, Roman, and Judeo-Christian tradition. So if you believe any of that part of your culture is something, again, exceptional, well, then that's whiteness and you're racist. Under the heading of status, power, and authority, they have respecting authority. Now, I'm not one to say respect authority just because it has authority. But I'm certainly one to say that if it's based upon reality and it has some authority, let's say, let's look at reality and these ideas of authority because they are expressions of reality, then yeah, you should accept that authority and have respect for that authority of reality. But of course, 
my believing in that, though that's whiteness and therefore racist. Another section of whiteness is called future orientation. So if you're thinking about things in the future and orienting yourself towards those future goals, well that's whiteness and therefore racist. And one of the subcategories is delayed gratification. Another category they have is justice. And one of the subcategories under justice is intent counts. So if you believe that you have a justice system where your intent should count, well that's whiteness and therefore racist. By the way, I would love to do an entire video about this idea of intent within the justice system, which I take to be one of the paramount reasons why Western civilization is so unique. Because early on, we carved out an idea that intent actually matters within justice. One of the other categories is competition. And some of the subcategories under competition is that having an action orientation, well that's whiteness and therefore racist. And they double down on that by also putting a subcategory of must always do something about a situation. If you believe that you must always do something about a situation, well, that's whiteness and therefore racist. Also, one of the subcategories under this is decision making. So if you're decisive, well, that's whiteness and therefore racist. And yet another subcategory here is master and control of nature. And again, I would take that to also be a mastering and controlling of your own human nature. But again, me thinking that, well, that's just whiteness and therefore I'm racist. And one of the smaller ones that I want to finish with is under the heading of communication. And they say the king's English rules, well, that's whiteness and therefore racist. And I wanted to bring that one up because, of course, you need to have clear language in order to be rational and logical and bring those rational and logical ideas with into discussion. So, how do all of these things destroy the idea of hero? Well, very briefly, as I'm always saying, the idea of hero is a paragon of virtue. And in order to be a paragon of these virtues, first you have to have a thing called right reason. That's reason in accord with reality. Then you have to have prudence, which is correct decision making. Then you've got to have justice. Then you have to have fortitude or courage. Then you have to have temperance. And all of these things proceed downwards. If you don't have the one previous, you can't have the one after. And you need to have all of these working in conjunction with each other to be a paragon of these virtues and therefore a hero. So let's go backwards up this ladder to see how these ideas destroy the idea of hero. The last thing on this list is temperance. And one of the things within this list of whiteness that destroys temperance is the idea of delayed gratification, which is something which is future oriented, which again they label as whiteness. So if you're saying to yourself, listen, I need to stop doing this right now in order to make room for something else, which is in part what this virtue is all about. It's saying that you don't want something like your courage to skew your idea of what is just. Therefore, at some point, you will need to delay some kinds of gratification, saying that, well, if I did this now or in this manner, well, that would be something that is against justice, or that would be something that is against prudence. Therefore, I can't do this now. I need to look at the bigger picture and how all of these things work together and how how they will express themselves within the future. But of course, if future orientation and delayed gratification are something that are whiteness and therefore racist and evil, well, they destroy completely the idea of temperance. If you destroy that virtue within this dynamic, you destroy the idea of hero. Let's go further back up the line of virtues to fortitude or courage. Now, fortitude and courage is the prompting of you to live out these virtues within your life. And you will have to live them out in a way that is courageous because, of course, there are going to be many things within life that are going to be opposed to this. So you need to have fortitude, you need to have courage in order to bring them into the reality of your life and your actions. But of course, if we look at this list, this list of whiteness, one of the things under competition is being action oriented. If you're action oriented, well, that's whiteness and you're racist. Again, being decisive, that's whiteness. Being someone who thinks that they can master and control their own nature, well again, that's listed under whiteness. All of these things are necessary for fortitude and courage because you're mastering your own nature. You're saying, part of my nature is disordered. I got to master that and then I'm making the decision and being action oriented and bringing these things into reality within my life, into actions that will be opposed by others, that will be opposed by what is going on about me. That's why I need courage. And that's how I can participate in fortitude. But again, all of these things are destroyed. And therefore, your fortitude and your courage in the traditional sense, that's destroyed as well. And therefore, the traditional hero is destroyed. 
let's go back up the ladder to the virtue of justice. Well, the traditional idea of justice is to render to everyone what is their due. But the thing is that to make sure that you're rendering to everyone what is their due, well, you got to look at that person as an individual. And of course, individualism is on this list as whiteness and therefore racist and evil. Also, I would bring into this the idea of respect for authority, because some of the authority that has to do with justice is the fact that each person has rights according to their being a human being, and one of those rights is that you treat them in a just way. But that, of course, all comes from the idea of rights, which is an idea of authority, and if you're not supposed to have any respect for authority, that destroys that as well. Because, of course, you always have to remember that these people are oriented towards social justice, not the justice of the individual, which is what true justice emanates from. Now, you can have justice that is for a society, but it needs to be based upon the justice of the individual. If you look only at the justice, which is social, that is social justice, and completely ignore and obliterate the justice for an individual, well, that social justice isn't justice at all. So again, once again, we destroy the idea of hero by destroying the traditional idea of justice through this list of whiteness. And let's go back up the ladder one more rung to prudence. Now, prudence is correct decision making, decision making based upon right reason. But of course, once again, under that heading of competition, being decisive is whiteness and therefore racist and evil. The idea that you must always do something about a situation, well, that's whiteness and therefore racist and evil. And if you can't have decision making in this way, then you destroy prudence and therefore destroy the master of all of these virtues, which certainly destroys every other virtue underneath it and completely obliterates the idea of hero. But they're not done there. Let's go back up the rung one more time to the idea of right reason. Well, right reason is reason in accord with reality. And it's a statement that reality has certain rules and your reason should express itself in accord with those rules. But of course, as they say within this list, emphasis on the scientific method, objectivity and rational thinking itself, let alone cause and effect, is whiteness and therefore racist and evil. Therefore, the entire idea of right reason is completely obliterated. And that's the forebearer of all of these virtues. And of course, laid even on top of all of that is the fact that this system that I've been describing of a paragon of virtue, it is a system of cause and effect. And therefore, you need to obliterate this system as well. And these ideas all came out of Western civilization. They were described in a pioneering way by the Greeks and a little bit by the Romans, and then taken up by the Christians. But of course, within this list, any idea that there is a primacy of Western ideas, Western tradition, Greek Roman and, as I say, Judeo-Christian traditions, well, that's all whiteness and therefore racist and evil. So, of course, the entire idea that hero is based upon also needs to be wiped away. And so, to bring this all back to what I was talking about at the first, why am I going over these things that have no connection to comics? Well, I'm going over them because this is the inherently understood, accepted basis of all of the language that these people who do these podcasts for Marvel or who make these statements in these interviews, these people like ta Coates, like G. Willow Wilson, all of these people who put out these interviews with main publications like the New York Times, this is the fundamental basis of the ideas that they accept as how society should work to begin with. And again, that brings us back to Sana Amanat, who was specifically brought into Marvel to use her background to teach these ideas, to, in her words, push these positive ideas as the new ethics and morals, the new way to act for people within a society through this psychological way, through this use of modern mythology in order to bring about the quote-unquote good of progressivism and a progressive society. And I think that focusing on hero is something that is very important. Why? Well, because a traditional hero is the source and summit of all of these ideas that we have championed within Western civilization for so long. These ideas of individualism, of self-reliance, of objective rational thinking, of respect for the Greek, Roman, and Christian traditions of ideas, of respect for authority, of being action-oriented and decisive, 
as being someone who uses clear language to express their ideas and therefore can understand others. All of these ideas are summed up in that paragon of virtue which is known as a hero. And if there comes a time within our future where you can no longer produce even a work of fiction that has a traditional hero in it, well, that's the point where you can positively know that these progressive people have won. So, if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe, and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this. All right, I'll see you later. Bye.